an extra hour or so before we had to be somewhere. So I went over to the park. In years past, I've walked the park, gotten to know people in our community. And I met this gentleman about two or three years ago. Uh, on Thursday, when I went and I was walking in the park, I, you know, I prayed ahead of time. I said, Lord, please, I'd like to get in a discussion, a spiritual discussion. I just don't want to waste my time here. Um, and so I was praying about it. And at first, I was just walking. I met a man with a little dog, and we struck up a conversation with him about his little dog and everything, but the dog was kind of <laughs> going his own way, so we had to end that conversation. But I walked over to the garden place. There, over in Madison Middles, our uh, uh, park over there, there's an area where people can come and plant vegetables. they got a section each. And so the people in the garden, they're about the same ones every year, and so they get to know one another. There's quite a few garden plots there. But there was only one man in the garden, and I knew who it was right away, Bob. I've talked to him several times, and so... Um, I went and I had talked to him, and uh, I, I, didn't mention, I didn't want to necessarily mention his first name. Sorry about that, I hope. You know, because we get uh, people will listen and everything. But let me say in advance, in the discussion that I had with him, uh, in times past, we've talked about many different things, but I've never gotten a spiritual discussion with him. But I want to say right in advance, I am no way making fun at all of Bob or what his beliefs are, in no way. I mean, he's an older gentleman, he's a very intelligent man, and he's a hard worker, okay? So I just want to, the, the purpose of my relaying this is just to let you know that people decide about certain things in different ways. And so we talked about California. He came from California, and I, I, reminded, I was reminded where he lived in California. And then I said, you know, I got a granddaughter now that's going to Westmont College. And he goes, oh, yeah. Uh, Santa Barbara area, Montecito area, a very wealthy area, Westmont College. In fact, Oprah has a place out there, and Harry and Megan have their place out there in Montecito. So uh, Westmont College is right there, probably neighboring on some of that property. I don't know. But at any rate, he says, yeah, I, when I was younger, I went to, when I was going to college, I played, we played basketball against Westmont. So I know that place well. And then we talked about other things. I said, boy, I bet you California has changed. He said, oh, yeah, it has changed. He said, when my folks moved there, they bought a house, a three-bedroom ranch house for $20,000. I said, how much is that house worth now? He says, probably about a half million, you know, a typical three-bedroom ranch, half million. And so, uh, you know, we were talking. He asked me, how, how's the church doing? And I said, because he knew I was a pastor. I told him that other times. And I said, we're, we're doing well. I said, we've got... Um, uh, great people. I love those people over at Grace. I said, but we have the need for having more young adults with children. That's a need that we have because that's the future of the church. I just mentioned that. And he said, you know, I have a friend that goes to the United Methodist Church downtown. Yeah, that's the same way down there, just an older congregation. And then he says, you know, I'm getting up there in age two. He told me he was 81. He said, uh, I got to start curtailing what I'm doing now a little bit. I'm slowing down. And so that was the signal to me. I said, Bob, let me ask you this. If something were to happen to you uh, that you were to die, would you have a home? Would you have a home in heaven to live with the Lord? And he said, Bob, he said, I want to be honest with you. And I suspected this, but I never heard him say this. He said, I am an atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't believe there's a heaven. I believe that when you die, that's it. That's over and it's done with. That's all there is to it, you know. And so I, I said, Bob, have you read the Bible before? He says, oh, yeah, it's a well-known historical book. So I've read the Bible, you know. And uh, then I proceeded to tell him my testimony of how, uh, I, what I was raised with. I was raised as a Lutheran, you know. We ran to church in the, oh, growing up through Sunday school years. And then my mom transferred to the Baptist church. But I told him, I said, I had a grandmother that preached to me all the time. She had 18 grandsons, okay, my grandmother did. And any time the grandsons came along, she's got to preach to them. She was the preacher in our family. She's only 4'11". She only finished fourth grade. But she would tell us about how she came to Christ. And so I repeated the stories that I often repeat. I said, you know, my grandmother used to say, it certainly is wonderful to be a Christian. And I would say, Grandma, I'm already a Christian. And I'm telling Bob this, say, and... Uh, and she says, no, no, you're not a Christian. If you were a Christian, you wouldn't do the things that you do. <laughs> she says, I was in high school, well, all the through grade school, but in high school. I was in high school at the time. She said, when Jesus comes into a person, he changes them, and he gives them new desires, 
you know. And so, you know, I'd leave the room. And, but one night, uh, I, I slept in Duluth, Minnesota. It, it, there's a, uh, we had one bedroom, a window in that basement bedroom where I was with my older brother. And, and that sun, the moon was just shining really bright there. And I don't know what it was, the contrast between the light and the darkness or what. But the words of my grandmother penetrated my heart that night. And as I was telling him a story, I said, her words were, what is it profit of man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And those words penetrated my heart, you know. And I said, you know, I, I was just a young man. I really didn't need to worry about death too much at that time. But I said, you know, rode motorcycle and stuff like that. So... I said, what happened to me? I really didn't know if I was going to heaven. You know, I heard the story. We went over to a Baptist church, and my grandmother told that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He came to this earth. He lived a perfect life, and then he went to the cross to die for our sins on the cross. And then he rose again from the dead, conquering sin and death, and, and God was pleased with his sacrifice. And so... I even quoted John 3.16 to him, you know, the most important verse in the Bible, one that's very clear. And, uh, you know, after I gave him my testimony, he said, you know, I'm not afraid to die. He said, I'm really not, you know. He was condescending to me. If you want to believe the Bible, he was kind of saying, he didn't say those words, but I understood what he was saying. You can. I, there's no problem with that. It's just that I don't believe that, you know. And then he said this. My... I'm, I believe I've lived a good life. I've tried, you know, I've... He told me about his divorce. He divorced his wife. He said, but it's an amical divorce, and that's what brought him back to Illinois. But he says, whenever I can, I try to help out people and all this. And I knew what he was saying. He was saying this. He didn't believe there was a God, but if there was a God, he more or less fulfilled the requirements that they would have so he would have a life after. You know, so he was saying, I said, you know, Bob, I said... The, the most people in this world thinks that if you like on a scale, if your good works outweigh your bad works, you're in, you're okay. I said, but you know, that is not the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is that a man must be perfect to go to heaven. Oh, right away, you know, I said, no, nobody's perfect, right? But that's why God had to come to this earth and he lived a perfect life. He went to the cross and he paid for our sins on the cross and he rose again from the dead. But God now, because of what Jesus did, can give a man Jesus' righteousness by putting our trust in him. I said, Bob, the Bible says, you know, as the book of Hebrews, we're looking at it at Hebrews 11 this morning. He said, I told him, but... It, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But the ones who put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in Jesus Christ, God has the right to give them the righteousness of Christ. That's the perfection a man needs to go to heaven. That's the only thing, only way a person will get into heaven. Well, we shook hands and we left, you know. I'll get him maybe a chance again of course, to talk about, to Bob again, but I'm praying for him. But the reason I bring that up, as I mentioned, is that... Um, all of us have decisions that we make in our lives. We have what we're going to eat for lunch, minor decisions, but we all have major decisions. Major decisions, who we're going to get married, where we're going to live, if we're going to get married or not, you know? Or, and what are we going to do with this Bible, and what are we going to do with the person of Jesus Christ? Those are major decisions that each of us has a, a you know, a choice to make. Well, you know what he said. I told you what are the, some of the things that he believed in. And we're looking at a man this morning, most of the, uh, probably the most well-known man in ancient history, Moses. He's so respected by the Jews and even by the Muslims and Christians, of course. But he made some critical decisions in his life. And so I'd like you to turn, if you would, in your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 11. We're gonna, I'm going to read starting in verse 23. But this chapter, we're, we're going through now famous chapters in the Bible, and we're in chapter 11. And I can't rush through this chapter. You know, you, I suppose you could summarize this chapter in one message, but I'm already on the third message, and we'll have one more message after this. It's just, it's just too good. And going back in history, the book of Hebrews was written for this person purpose because all the Jewish people were the first believers in Jesus. They were all Jews. 
Because Jesus was a Jew, and all the 11 to 12 apostles, disciples, well, Judas, of course, was the son of perdition, and he denied Christ, I mean, he uh, betrayed Christ. But all of those men, as they bear, bore testimony, and Jesus, there was 120 Jews gathered there in the upper room when the Holy Spirit descended on Pentecost. And the church grew, 3,000 one day, 5,000 the next day, as they preached the word, and as the Holy Spirit was leading these apostles. But they were all Jewish. That's the way church started. But there were a number of Jews who would not accept the message of Jesus, that he was the Messiah. And they relied on the books of Moses. And the religion of the Jews had degenerated to such an extent that they put additional, they fenced the law of Moses. So, you know, if you're not going to commit this, they made it even tighter so you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. And so they had all these rituals. And they were teaching in the synagogues that a person is saved by his good works by performing the law of Moses and doing these deeds that they set out. That's how man was saved, made right with God. And, of course, the message of Jesus Christ was totally against this. Jesus spoke with authority. And the apostles revealed that Jesus was the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, just as John the Baptist said. So the book of Hebrews, we don't know who the writer is, but he was writing to these Jews that some had trusted in Christ, some were on the verge of... They, they were sympathetic toward the message of these apostles, but they might not have trusted Christ. In fact, they had pressure from their families to go back to the law of Moses and obey that law. So the writer of Hebrews is telling these men in the 11th chapter, throughout this whole book, but in the 11th chapter, all the forefathers, way back to Adam and Eve, they all were made right by faith, not by works. And so we looked at the first one. We said, uh, Abel, Abel worshipped by faith, an acceptable worship where Cain did not. And of course, you know what happened. Cain killed his brother Abel. And then we looked at Enoch. Enoch walked with God by faith. 365 years, uh, well, he gave birth to sons and daughters, but he walked with the Lord, I think, for 365 years, if I'm not mistaken. And God took him home. Enoch is one in Scripture that never died. And the other one in Scripture, of course, was Elijah. God took these men right to heaven. He walked by faith. And then we considered uh, Noah who worked by faith, 120 years it took him to build that ark, and there was no rain up until that time. The book of Genesis says that there was water that came up from the earth. And here Noah was building this huge boat, 120 years. It took him to build that. And if you go down, of course, to the Cincinnati area, a little old, now you can go to the ark encounter and see how massive it was a ship. And in that ship, God brought to him two of every type of animal that was in existence at that time, as well as seven uh, types of any animal that was clean because there was going to be sacrifice involved after they got out of the ark. But birds, any air-breathing animals, were, came, they came to know him, and God then, as you know, uh, released the windows in heaven and underneath the earth, and all the world was flooded, this entire earth was flooded, and that's why the Grand Canyon, I'm sorry, was not made by a little stream that went through a million years. It was created by a huge hydrological effect, and that's evidence throughout, and you can find seashells on Pikes Peak in Colorado. You see, there was a flood that covered this whole, but Noah and his three sons and their wives, eight people were saved through the flood. But Noah worked by faith. And then we looked at the patriarchs, and we described this. They waited by faith. Abraham was given promises that he was going to bless the entire world, his seed. He was going to give birth to a seed of promise. And it was finally at the age of 100, where Sarah was 90, that they gave birth to Isaac. But Abraham never saw his promises, that his seed was going to be like the stars of heaven, the sand of the seashore. He never saw that. He only had one son, Isaac. And then after Isaac was given the same promises, and then Joseph had the 12 sons. He was called, name was changed to Israel. So those are the Israelites. He was given that promise. And they, and they waited for their promise. They never saw that promise. Joseph, 
the ruler of Egypt, and I won't go into those details, but he himself knew that promise, knew that God had promised, by the way, too, a deliverer to come. In the Garden of Eden, it was promised that a deliverer would come. They were waiting for it. They never saw it, but they waited, and God rewarded them. But now, let's consider Moses. I'm going to start reading in verse 23. And we'll get read uh, just down to 29. Follow along with me. I'm uh, in New King James Version. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command, Pharaoh's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, he, with the Israelites, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. So we want to say this. Moses made some decisions, but from the options he had, he weighed those decisions and made some of the wisest choices anybody could ever make in his life. Now, you and I have choices, and we're going to learn from Moses. We, uh, we want to see the choices he made because we have the same choices in some way. He dealt with the prominence. He dealt with pleasures. He dealt with treasures of Egypt. He dealt with... Um, we'll look at these as we go along here, okay? So l- let's look at first the, the parents of Moses. They weighed their options concerning priorities, priorities. What was really important to them, and they chose life for their beautiful baby boy. Verse 23 again says, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. Well, this is, this history is so amazing. Okay, Moses was born in a rotten time, a very terrible time. Everybody thinks that they're born in terrible days. We think that about our country right now. But Moses was born at a time when 400 years has passed since the Israelites came down into Egypt. Remember, Joseph was uh, betrayed by his brothers and he was sold to Ishmaelites who brought him down to Egypt. But he became second in command of Egypt. Okay, I won't go into the details. But so he, when the famine came... The Lord revealed to Joseph what was going to happen on earth. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. For seven years, you take and you store up food for the seven years of famine because they're coming. Joseph did that. And all the nations of the world would come to Joseph to get food. And so did Jacob's son, the Israelites, come down. Jacob thought that Joseph was dead. The brothers came down. The brothers probably thought he was dead too. They didn't know he was next in line, second to only the Pharaoh. They came down to get food. And so when Joseph revealed himself finally to his brothers, he said, come on down, bring my father down. You all come down here and I'll give you the best land in Egypt. So they came down 75 and in 400 years or so, they grew to millions of people. Now, that was a problem Because God was blessing them. That was a problem for these Egyptians. One of the pharaohs, or in the past anyway, decided to put these Israelites to work. And so these many pyramids that you see, those great building structures of ancient Egypt, largely built by the Jews, very most likely. But they still uh, prospered, and they still were growing in numbers. And so a new pharaoh, the Bible says, a new pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph. And he commanded that every Hebrew baby that would be born would be thrown alive into the Nile. Crocodiles, etc. But these parents, their names were Amram, the man, and Jochebed, the wife. They, they gave birth to a son at this time. 
And that son was a beautiful baby. Now, parents always say babies are beautiful, right? Their baby is really gorgeous. But there was something in that son, that beautiful baby, that they thought that this might be the deliverer that God had promised. So what they did is they hid the baby. Now, probably the penalty, they had to weigh the options now, the penalty for not throwing this baby in the Nile would probably be death. But they were willing to risk that. And so they hid the baby for three months. And then when the, you know, could babies start crying louder and louder and stuff. And so what they did is they went down to the river and they got these reeds and they made a basket, a little ark. And they pitched it with pitched around and they put the baby in the ark and they went and brought it down to the river and put it in the bulrushes, you know, the cattails there. And then they sent, they already had two children. They had Miriam and they had Aaron, the, uh, who was about three or four years older than the ba- their baby born. He was, the edict had not been given yet. And so Miriam was standing by, walked in the bulrushes. And you know what? God orchestrated the events then. Because the daughter of Pharaoh came down to the river to bathe and with her maidens, and she saw this ark over there in the bulrushes. So she sent one of her maidens, they brought it to her. When she took the lid off this basket, this ark, the baby cried. And her heart as a mother was touched. She said, this is one of the Hebrew babies. And right then Miriam, thinking very quickly, ran up to her and said, do you want me to go get one of the Hebrew mothers to nurse the baby for you? And she said, go. So she went and got the baby's mother, her mother, Jochebed, and Jochebed came back to the daughter of Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh's daughter said, take this baby and nurse this baby, and I will give you wages to do so. And so Moses was with his mother and father. We don't know to exactly what age she nursed him and she was paid for it. But it was probably during this time that his parents told him who his God was. And that the Jewish people were suffering, but that the Lord had promised a deliverer to come. Maybe they even put it in his mind and said, he didn't, they didn't call him Moses yet. They said, maybe you might be the deliverer. So after a time, when the boy grew, that, that's all we know, the boy grew, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses because she said, I drew him from the water. So they, their priorities, in light of what their, all their options were, they determined by faith that they were going to keep their baby alive. And now let's just say by application right now, we're living in a very difficult time. Women who are becoming pregnant in the United States are facing pressure on many fronts, including their parents and others, to abort the fetus, which is really a little person inside of a woman. Now, you know, I don't care how they cry it and how they scream it and say, a woman ought to have right to do what she wants with her own body. Problem, that which is in her body is not a part of her body. It's a person that has different blood from the mother and is nourished in the mother's womb, but it's not the mother's body. It's another person. But we're living in a day and age when, I tell you, when somebody talks about women have the right to do what they want, the crowds cheer. I mean, Planned Parenthood is financed in a big way to prescribe and to give abortions and lead women to, to have abortions. This is the day and age in which we're living. We need to pray for women and parents and such today because, listen, even as these parents, they made a a wise decision in their priorities to allow the baby to live. And from that came the deliverer of Egypt, from Egypt, I should say. Well, that was the faith that these parents exercised, and no doubt they even... Uh, kind of uh, the baby kind of understood or the little boy kind of understood that this couple sacrificed that he might live. So now notice how Moses, let's talk about Moses, how he weighed his options by faith and made wise decisions. The first area in his life where Moses had to make a decision was in the area of prominence. Okay, prominence. What is prominence? Well, here's what the scripture says. By faith, Moses, 
when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. The time of his age about that was about 40 years old. Now, every person in this world longs to be significant in some ways. Nobody wants to be just a nobody. That's not within the makeup of man. We want to feel that we're somebody, a somebody. And so you'll see even little children. What happens when you bring up little children and you're not paying attention to? They'll act up. They'll misbehave. So that they signal that you've got to give me some attention, right? And you think of what adults do to get prominence and attention. You ever see what these Olympic athletes go through to excel in a sport, to gain notoriety? Amazing what they will do. How about the way that we dress and we, uh, you know, people wear, you know, have hairstyles that are cool hairstyles and tattoos and rings and, and everything like this. Everybody's involved in it, but listen, people don't want to be obscure. Do you sometimes wonder why in the world would anybody run for a political office? <laughs> why would you do that, you know? A lot of times, I'm sure there's love of country, but a lot of times people do it for prominence, right? And you rem- I rem- uh, read one time Dr. James Dobson's book. I think it's called Hide and Seek. I think that's the name of the book. But he describes how a man by the name, uh, he didn't tell the name right away, He said this man went into the Marines. He was dishonorably discharged from the Marines. He married a woman, and the woman just treated him, bossed him around, bossed him around, belittled him. He grew up that way, being belittled. And he once earned some money, and and he got on his knees and begged his wife, because she was uh, separating from him, begged his wife to take this money that he earned. I mean, he was so belittled. And that man took the one skill that he learned in the Marines with a rifle and went up in a a book storage and and, and put a bullet through John Fitzgerald Kennedy's head, Lee Harvey Oswald. He, as a man, was put down so much. You can't excuse him, but I'm just saying that's what drove him to... If you know anything about John F. Kennedy, he was like, this is like Camelot. He was the most handsome president they'd ever had, and his wife was beautiful, Right? And they had these, his life was perfect. And that's the one that Lee Harvey Oswald decided to uh, assassinate. Well, that's, so people long for prominence. But here it says that Moses, when he became, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Do you realize this? Maybe you haven't thought about it. Very possibly, Moses was being groomed to be the Pharaoh in the future. Say, so why would you say that? Well, apparently this Pharaoh did not have a son. He had a daughter. And there wouldn't be a woman to take the Pharaoh's place. So she had a son, an adopted son, whom she named Moses. Now Moses was sent through all the learning of Egypt. Um, Stephen is a uh, message in the book of Acts taking the history of Israel, said Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Josephus, a Jewish historian, said that Moses was a great statesman. Josephus recorded that Moses was a military hero as well. He was responsible for unusual victory over the Ethiopians. We don't know if that's true, but that's what a historian wrote 2,000 years ago. John MacArthur, in his message on uh, Moses, said this, His formal education would have included learning to read and write hieroglyphics, hieratic, hieratic, I don't know what that is, and probably some Canaanite language. He already had learned of Hebrew from his mother, of course. Philo, the Jew, Jewish philosopher, again, well over 2,000 years uh, ago, said, Moses learned arithmetic, geometry, poetry, astronomy. He was privileged. Another Bible commentator said this, In the world, fame always brings a certain amount of honor. If you are born into the right family, or you are a successful athlete or entertainment, the world will think you as great. They name them goats nowadays, right? These athletes are the best. Whether you are not, uh, if you have money, 
regardless of how you got it, the world will think that hell you hold you in high esteem. If you have enough degrees by your name, certain people will think you have arrived. The same is true in regard to political power and uh, many other types of human success. Moses had most of those things. However, even though Moses was inside track to possibly being the Pharaoh one day, he knew the promises of God. He'd been instructed in those promises of God. He knew that that was the people to which he was born. Can you imagine what it must have been like when he grew up in this home and he saw these Jewish people suffering even as a little boy and he saw the Egyptian taskmasters mistreating those people? He knew it. And so when he came of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but he wanted by choice to identify with the Hebrew people. So in the area of prominence, Moses considered his option and made some choices. Then consider, he made some decisions in the area of pleasure confers options. He weighed the options. Well, pleasure, yeah. Right away we might think bad pleasure, but listen. God gives us things, the book of Timothy, for us to richly enjoy. You know, you think of all the things that you and I enjoy that are not wrong. I mean, I like to go out and eat a good meal, don't you? Somebody asked me last week, what's the best meal you ever had in your life? I said, uh, I think it was Ruth Chris. Chris, I went and had a steak at Ruth Chris. You know, <laughs> that was a great steak. I loved that, you know. We enjoy that. Do you enjoy the sunsets? You know, there are things, we had young adults over at our place out at the lake, over in Lake Somerset over there yesterday. It was a hot day, but we were out on the water, you know, the cool water and everything. God's nature is incredible. You know, don't you enjoy these things that God has given us in life? By his hand, he's given us to these things. But there are also pleasures that are sinful pleasures. And there are even legitimate pleasures that can be taken to extreme. But here it says, Moses Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The King James Bible has the, the, the pleasures of sin um, that are short-lived, that are only for a season. Let's just think about that. You know, David, David made a bad choice one day, one night in his palace when he saw this beautiful woman bathing. He called her, and he had sex with Bathsheba. And what a night, a thrilling night for David it was with this beautiful woman. But she was the wife of one of his 30 mighty men. One of those 30 mighty men, Uriah, was a man that was so faithful to David. And he actually had Uriah put to death because Bathsheba became pregnant, and he wanted to cover it up. How horrible. But you know what? That wasn't all that David suffered. Sins, pleasures. You know, the Bible says very truthfully, there is pleasure in sin, but it's short-lived. And so he suffered sexual immorality in his family. As you know, his son Absalom tra uh, was a traitor against him, wanted the kingdom for himself, so there was civil war. David suffered because of that original sin with Bathsheba. You see, there are pleasures, but they're only for a season. And you know what? If you observe Egyptian art, you see the types of life those Egyptians lived at that time. It was an immoral life. Um, but so he weighed the options, but he turned against those pleasures. Don't you realize with his money that he had, his prominence that he had, he could have indulged in any way he wanted to. I remember talking to a, Mark plays hockey. I had a, a guy that I went to school with that played hockey. He played for the Los Angeles Kings. I was from northern Minnesota. And he said after every game, he could, there were women lined up outside the locker room. He could have anyone he wanted to. That's the way it was. When you are in a position of notoriety and fame and prominence like Moses was, he could have had all the pleasures of sin he wanted to. He had the money. But he chose not. He'd rather suffer with the children of God. Well, then notice had to weigh and make decision concerning the area of treasures in Egypt. Now, I guess we could get a lot of detail here, but let me just tell you. In 1922, one of the greatest archaeological findings was unearthed. It was discovered by an archaeologist by the name of Howard Carter. 
he discovered King Tut's tomb. Uh, that Tut was uh, the name of, uh, a long name, I, I couldn't even pronounce it. But anyway, what happened is that tomb, you know, th those pyramids were actually housed uh, tombs of the uh, pharaohs. And they would put food in those tombs and they would put wealth and gold in those tombs. And they would, of course, embalm the body and they would have it in a sarcophagus. And, but all those tombs had already been robbed. They started, there were tomb raiders who raided in the, before Christ and after Christ. All those tombs, though they were uh, bigger tombs, they were robbed. But this one tomb of King Tut was buried. Somehow it got buried. Maybe a flood or something like that. And this archaeologist in 1922 found it. And the door had been sealed, but there was a little opening. And he looked into this tomb. This is the way he described it. And he lit a candle and he let his eyes adjust. And his comments were, he was struck dumb with amazement. Why? Because there was gold everywhere in that tomb of King Tut's tomb. And now it's displayed in a museum everywhere, the amount of gold. That's only a sampling of the wealth that was in Egypt that Moses had access to. What does the scripture said? Moses, considering the option, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He didn't just say, oh, uh, I don't care about any wealth. No. The way he reasoned was this. The reproach of Christ, who was the deliverer, the Messiah to come. God who created everything has more wealth than this worth has. So he was looking forward to the wealth that God had and could reward. Remember what Hebrews says? He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hey, stop for a minute. We've talked about prominence. We've talked about pleasures. We've talked about treasures. How is it with us? You know, there are, peop there are people who violate their conscience, do whatever they can to gain the wealth right now. Then notice... Oh, let me tell you about, we have, I had two examples of men who in our time have rejected this type of life. Jim Elliott, uh, most of you know the name of Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott went to Wheaton College, graduated in the 19, early 1950s, or uh, I forget what years it was. But he and his wife, Elizabeth, went to the mission field in Ecuador and working with the jungle people, cannibal people that never heard anything from the outside. He went with 500 in, uh, missionaries to contact him in the interior, and all five missionaries were put to death, okay? They were martyred. So Jim Elliott's got a great reputation. But Jim Elliott said this, He is no fool who to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Right? So what should we invest our time and our efforts with to get money? Or should we invest our time and efforts to gain that which we cannot lose, the reward of the Heavenly Father? William Border, Borden was the, fa uh, the heir of the great uh, Borden family. He was uh, raised and went to Yale. He went to Princeton Divinity School. But William Borden, the money that he was given as an heir, he gave it all to missions. And then he himself went as a missionary to uh, Egypt, I think it was, to the Muslim people in Egypt. And when he was there, in a short time, he contracted meningitis and he died as a young man. And the rest of the world put it forth that here was the waste of a life, wasted life. When Bill Borden was on his deathbed, this were, these, was, this, these were his words, no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. He gave his wealth away because he knew by faith that the Lord was a rewarder of those who would diligently seek him. He obeyed the Lord with no regrets. So then Moses had to weigh and make a decision concerning people pressure. So let me just read the scripture. All of us, people have an effect on our lives. Our family has an effect on our lives. We find out that the Islamic people that in other countries, when they make a decision and they trust in Jesus Christ, their family disowns them. They will, they will brutalize them. 
people have an effect on our life. You know, teenagers face peer pressures, right? Adults face peer pressures. People have an effect on our life. This is what the Bible says about Moses, though. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is an invisible. Now, if you go back and you read back in Exodus, you find out what happened is Moses, he identified with the children of uh, Israel, and when a taskmaster was brutalizing a, ch- a child of Israel, a, a Hebrew, Moses looked this way and that way, and he killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand. The next day, he saw two Hebrew you know, men arguing with one another. He says, why do you argue with one another? And that one man came back at him. He says, who made you a judge over us anyway? He said, are you going to do to me what you did with that Egyptian, and kill him and bury him? So he knew, everybody knew now. And so he fled Egypt. But here, it says he fled from the face of Pharaoh. That's what it says in uh, Exodus. But here it says he fled Egypt by, he forsook Egypt by faith, not fearing the wrath of the king. And you say, oh, that seems so contradictory. I, I tell you the truth, I don't, can't figure it out yet why it says one thing and one thing, another and another thing. But it does not say, in even in Exodus, he fled Egypt, he forsook Egypt, But it doesn't say, and he fled from the face of the Pharaoh. Now, you realize that Pharaoh was his grandfather. But I don't, he he knew what that man was like, though. He knew he would be totally displeased. But it says that Pharaoh was going to take his life. But he knew of the ramifications. And maybe, you know, some people might have said, well, I'm going to go for a time and I'll come back because that's the only life he knew. He lived in luxury and all this. That's, and he, that's all the life he lived. But he fled to Midian and he stayed there for 40 years. He never returned. Turned his back on all that. And it said he was not afraid of the father. He grew up with, in, that, in that palace. So anyway, just likened unto Pharaoh you know, who faced the pressure of family, faced the pressure of people. George Beverly Shea used to sing at the Billy Graham Crusades, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be held, led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than worldly applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. Yes, I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Well, it says that Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh. He could picture in his mind's eyes the anger that his grandfather, step-grandfather would have. But consider, it said he saw him who was invisible. God, he was putting his trust in God. He wanted to do what God wanted him to do. Well, I'm just going to state this final one in closing. Moses had to weigh and make decisions in the areas of provision and protection. That's why they observed the Passover. The, the, The Hebrew people... There were 10 plagues, and those in Goshen never had one of them come to their property. Darkness, blood, lice, frogs, they were all in Egypt. Nothing came to Goshen. But now the last plague was going to be the death of the firstborn in every household. It was going to come to Goshen. And so Moses was given instruction. You kill a lamb or a goat, you take the blood, and with hyssop, you put it on here on the doorpost of your house, here on the doorpost, and here, like a cross. Put it on. Eat your meat. Get ready for your departure. You wonder sometimes that the people said, why do we have to do this? I don't understand. The Lord's not going to destroy us. They had to do it. There was not one house in Goshen where a, a, a firstborn was dead. But throughout the land of Egypt, who would not do that, every household there was a death of a firstborn. And then it says that by faith he he crossed the Red Sea. Well, there they were. They came to the edge of the sea, and Pharaoh decided to go against them, brought all his chariot, and the army was coming. And the people were crying out again. They really didn't have the faith. 
Why did you bring us out? They're going to kill us now out here in the wilderness. Moses said this, stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord. And the Lord told them what to do. They had the pillar of fire or the pillar of cloud that went between him and the Egypts at night. And then Moses would take his staff and put it over the Red Sea. And the, the, it, a strong east wind blew and blew that so it was on dry ground. The entire nation of Israel crossed on dry ground when they got to the other side. And the Pharaoh's army presumptuously went in after them. Then the Lord told them to put the rod back. And the waters just flooded over all these soldiers with their armor on and the chariots. And they were all buried in the Red Sea. And they saw the Egyptians no more. And I just want to say this, that you and I have the choice of what we're going to do for our provision and for our protection. Oh, we go to doctors. We make sure we have health insurance. But you know what? By faith, we need to look to the Lord for the protection that we have. Right? None of us knows here how much longer we have to live. But I tell you what, when we go on a trip, I don't know if you do, but when we go on the trip, say, Lord, give us safety as we travel, right? When you go to a doctor and he's going to work on you and perform surgery, you say, Lord, I, I believe this man has, is an intelligent man. He's had a lot of surgeries, but I look to you for protection, right? Well, that's what the life of Moses, the life of faith. He had these options and he made his decisions. He weighed them by faith. Let me just close by saying this. We are living in difficult times in the United States and in our world today. Probably everyone thinks they are living in darkest times, like I said that. Remo Moses, remember, was born in a time when Hebrew children were being thrown to death in the Nile. Our country, it seems to be sending, descending into greater immorali immorality and decline as we have never seen it before. I've never seen a time like this, how pitiful our country is, the way people are thinking. But guess what? Here's the point. God is still on the throne. You and I do not have to fear and worry. Because if we put our trust in God, God is the one who makes the decisions and he knows how to deliver his righteous ones from trials and temptations, right? And where James on Wednesday night, I love it when James gives a little twist in our prayer meeting, you know, because we pray about serious things. And James says, and we'll ask James to come over and maybe close us with prayer tonight. If you will, James, after we have our song, okay? Uh, we won't take a whole lot of prayer requests today because I've kind of preached a little longer maybe. But listen, you don't, listen, with some people, listen, if you don't vote for Trump, you're in big trouble. You know, and there's a lot of people, of course, that are saying, listen, Trump is a jerk. Vote for, you know what I'm saying? Listen, we don't have to, one way or the other, we put our trust in God. God is the one that can deliver and give revival to America and to give what we need in this country. And if it's his church, if it's his choice to continue to bring judgment on this nation, which we're seeing in regard to Romans chapter 1, let it be so. Bring it on. If that means that Christians who do not hire gay people in the, in the Christian school or whatever it is, bring it on. Because God will use that to accomplish great things for his purposes, right? We, and I, we don't have to fear at all. What a wonderful God we have. We can bear testimony to him, right? Let's close in closing prayer and have the uh, prayer uh, praise singers come forward, please. Our Heavenly Father, Moses was an amazing man, Lord. He made such a critical decision, it says, because he saw him who was invisible. He learned to trust in you. And that's why he wasn't foolish what he made, but just considered how great you were. He was looking for the Christ to come. And Heavenly Father, we've had Christ come. And Father, we, we know more than Moses knew because we have this holy book that you've given to us. Lord, but may we live our lives by faith. May we make decisions from the options that we have. May we weigh the options and make wise decisions, even as Moses did. For Christ's name's sake we pray it. Amen.